and we are live on Facebook, if my indicators are correct. So welcome. Uh, today we have uh, Moral Can Tell Me from Melbourne uh, on the ongoing ISPWP Wedding Photographer Interview Series. So the International Soci Society of Professional Wedding Photographers is the ISPWP. Moro is a uh, member with many, many, 20, I guess 25 plus years of wedding experience, right, Moro? Yeah. Oh, just hit, just hit 30, actually. Oh, just so. hit 30. Oh, got to yeah. update your yeah. website. <laughs> yes. And uh, has won multiple awards on the ISPWP uh, Wedding Photography Contest. So we're thrilled to have him here with us uh, to talk about his business and his photography and uh, and uh, look at some of his photos and uh, really dive in here a little bit. So welcome, Morrow. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. I'm very proud to be here. Yes. And thank you for chatting. It's a uh, good morning. Okay. Good morning from Australia. Yeah. That's right. Early, early morning in Australia. <laughs> we had to adjust the time. <laughs> we didn't want to do it at four o'clock in the morning for you. That would be tough. Well, it would have been an option, but I don't think it would have been good for no. my hair stop. No, no doubt about no. that. Especially it's if you right. have to shoot later today. <laughs> exactly. So uh, why don't we just start? Why don't you give yourself uh, an introduction, maybe how you got started and uh, where you're located sure. and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, my name is Mauro Can Tell Me, as we said. Um, I'm a wedding photographer in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I actually started photography from the age of 14. Um, I won my first photographic competition with the first photograph I ever took. And I still remember, well, what was the camera? It was the Canon AE-1. Wow. But that was the last Canon I ever bought. I then switched to Nikon, unfortunately. Uh -huh. But um, <laughs> Back so, in the day, though, the AE-1 yeah. was the camera. <laughs> it was. It was. Yeah. So, um, so... I sort of thought maybe I've got a little bit of a talent if I've uh, if I've actually won a competition with mm -hmm. my first photo. So it started. Well, you have my, to stop it for a second, Mara. I, I need to know what the photo yeah. was that won the contest. What was it? What was it? A photo of? Uh, well, it was uh, believe it or not, it was a photograph of a plate um, okay. with eggs on it, <laughs> and I actually uh, I placed um, letters on on the eggs, and it was called alphabetical eggs. Nice. So <laughs> art is an art black piece. Black Yes, it was, it was. But that, that's how basically photography found me. Um, I always say that photography found me rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, then basically because there was a shortage of, of photographers or wedding photographers in that era, um, I started college and um, didn't even finish high school and started photographic college at the age of 17. Um, and from there, uh, basically... Um, I got a part-time job in a wedding photography studio mm -hmm. and photographed my first wedding, believe it or not, at the age of 17. Wow, it's young. Yeah. That's like uh, we had uh, Stephen Hershaft Her 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 here and he started off at a very young age as well. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So, yes. So, I would, well, look, it was a blessing in disguise. Obviously, I was quite nervous. But um, starting at the age of 17, it was just thrown into it, really, because of the fact that, you know, I hadn't had too much experience. Obviously, my, my boss at the time thought I was ready for it. And I actually still remember the day that the um, film, the 120 rolls of film came back and they were processed. And he was looking at them in his office. And I was terrified. And I didn't mm -hmm. know what to expect. So I walked in and he sat me down and said, I cannot believe that you are 17 and you've photographed a wedding like this. This is amazing. Especially your so first he, wedding. Yeah. Yes, first wedding. Yeah. And he pulled out his diary and said, here's another 27 weddings for the year. Wow. So, wow. and, you and dive that, right in. <laughs> yes, I got, dove right into it. And, yeah. and to be honest, I never really wanted to be a wedding photographer. Um, you know, for me, it was always fashion at the age of 17. It was mm -hmm. about girls. Um, the good thing about it was the fact that, you know, um, I got to meet people and it was a great experience and, and that was really, you know, me thrusted into the industry rather than the other way around. But it was beautiful to sort of look back at now um, where at the time, you know, a portion of me was thinking, well, this could not be something I want to do. But mm -hmm. um, here I am talking to you about it 30 <laughs> years later. 30 years so, later. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but from there, um, really did stem you know, the, the heyday of wedding photography here in Melbourne, Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, I had my own business for, for a year or so and then went towards uh, managing another photographic studio in Melbourne. Um, and after a year or two, I, thought, well, I was the head photographer and manager of the studio. And listen to this, Joe, um, we photographed and I managed a studio that photographed 400 weddings a year. Wow. Now, this was me at the age of what? 23 mm -hmm. i would have been 
So I can remember looking at the diary and having maybe 19 weddings on a Saturday and another 15 on a Sunday. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was crazy. It was, it was a great ride. Um, but you must remember this would have been, what, 1993, 92? Mm-hmm. Uh, and for all the people out there that sort of don't know too much about Melbourne, Australia, um, at the time we were only a population of about three, three and a half million people. Um, but what drove the industry at that time was the fact that all the European migrants that had come mm-hmm. from Europe, um, this was all their first generation um, kids getting married. Mm-hmm. And because they'd come from a very simple life and, and you know, um, they were very, very proud to... So it was a big see, deal. Yeah, yeah it was big deal and even in those days i still remember looking at the paperwork and form um we were charging even then four to five thousand dollars a wedding Mm -hmm. now you can imagine in 1993 for what four or five thousand dollars a wedding was and and the fact of the matter is was it was really i look back at that now and i don't think those times will ever come back um but i was just really proud to be part of part in that era Mm -hmm. Um, and then that went on for about three years before uh, I nearly burnt myself out. And you can imagine how, um, you know, doing that for a period of time, but learnt a lot. Um, I think I learnt a lot about managing a business. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you're forced biggest... to, right? You, if you don't, you yeah. won't survive. You, you find, yeah. I'm sure there's tough times, but you find your way through it and you learn, like you said, you learn That's trial right. by fire. Uh, you mm. either learn or you die. <laughs> yes. And and the thing was was the fact that I was managing this studio, but the owner of the studio wasn't even a photographer. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, if you can consider the fact that really I was thrusted into this with no with no um, knowledge of a partner who was a photographer, so mm-hmm. I was learning as I was going. Um, the best part that came out of that, I think, towards the end, the owner had um, introduced a photographer to me who had just retired in Australia, and his name was um, Mark Keats. Now, I don't know if you've heard of Mark Keats, but he was sort of really my major mentor as a photographer. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, in Melbourne, Australia, he was probably, you know, one of the best wedding photographers um, in Australia at the time. And he put me under his wing for a year. And in that year, I learned so much about the art of photography mm-hmm. uh, that, uh, you know, there's nothing that I can do to repay back this gentleman. Um, it was just amazing. So... Um, basically I, think that, what I think happened. that's true for, for many photographers. It's not, it's not that you go to university or school to learn. Typically, it's a, a mentorship under someone that you really admire who's willing to take you under their wing. And uh, exactly. it's, a, it's wonderful that way. Yeah. And I yeah. think, you know, for people listening and watching out there, um, I think that's where a lot of people can gain a lot of knowledge. Mm-hmm. I guess, for, I guess for me in, in that era too, there wasn't YouTube, there wasn't the internet. Right. Um, or if it was, it would have been, was, was the internet around in 1995? Barely. Or? Barely. Barely. <laughs> barely. So, <laughs> yeah. There you go. Early so, days, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I guess in that respect, for me, this was sort of my, my internet. But, you know, I'm proud to sort of say now for people out there, you know, they can get educated a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. But I would recommend anyone who's sort of starting out to, to really, you know, follow, follow their dreams and follow photographers and, and go out there and, and, and learn. You know, um, I think sometimes, especially when you're starting off, it's, it's not about the dollar sign. Um, it's about just getting out there and, and seeing what people are doing out there in the industry. And that that information, I believe, is gold. Um, yeah. And if people can start off that way, and not only the photographing side, but also the business running side, because we have to survive, um, I think is is quite important. Yeah. Well, you have a, obviously a very unique perspective coming from your background in terms of running a, a large business. It's not just uh, like a lot of photographers are a one or two person uh, operation. So mm-hmm. to come up from a, from a larger studio with uh, you know four hundred plus weddings per year, uh, there's mm-hmm. a, there's a whole management side to that um, yes, above, above and beyond that. just the photography. So, uh, mm. what would you would you, if, if someone was newly wanting to be interested in wedding photography per se, would you mm-hmm. sort of push them in the direction of being that solo type photographer, or would you say you know set your sights on maybe a larger studio, um, a couple um, associates or employees? Which way would you tend to go if you were starting like today? Uh, well, if I'm starting today um, and, you know, with hindsight, obviously, um, I would definitely be working for another studio. I would at least work for a minimum of two years at a studio. Mm-hmm. Um, if it means I have a part-time job already um, and what do you call it there in America? Internship? Is it an internship mm-hmm. sort of internship, thing? Yeah. Where, 
mm-hmm. where you know if they're really starting out from 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 the start, I think um, that would be a great way to to learn the ropes and 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 a lot of the times not being a burden, of course, because being a photographer as well, you know, you need to do what you do without asking the questions. But it's also important that the photographer you're with um, is prepared to teach you and right. and you know is a good uh, communicator. Um, I think that's really really important. So starting off working for a studio, I think would be number one together with maybe you know obviously going to school so maybe a part-time school part-time work um would be the quickest way to, to gain the knowledge mm-hmm. it seems no. like there's really th- not that many large studios anymore i, I don't i mean i know there's, yeah. a, there's still a few um mm-hmm. but I, may, I would imagine in many parts of the country it would be hard to find a, a larger studio to internship under so I think yeah. that's why a lot of people you know uh, they lean on the workshops and the conferences to get a lot of mm-hmm. their knowledge but uh, I, I agree with you. I started off uh, working for a larger studio for a couple of years before I went off. And um, there are advantages to that. Um, yeah. Some of the business p- piece of it is sort of taken off your shoulders. You get to focus on the client interaction and the photography and you learn the business. Yeah. Uh, to yes. jump in with into everything would be a little bit tougher. Well, look, I definitely think you're totally right there. Um, and I guess, you know, with a lot of the, the studios that are sort of manned by one photographer, um, I think that's also a great thing these days too because costs are a lot higher than what mm-hmm. they probably been years ago. Yeah. But even for people starting out there, you know, to, to follow a photographer or even a person who works for himself would be a great start. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'd definitely, I'd definitely really sort of continue with that. So. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, what was I going to say, Joe? Um, so, yes, um, going back to what I was saying, that was when I was 24, mm. and then um, hence the start of Design by Mario at 26, um, and I've never looked back from there. So that's officially nearly 20 years ago that I opened up my studio. Yeah, now you're aging yourself. Uh, <laughs> no, I know. Seven. Um, but, yeah, but basically from that era, that was the heyday. So um, uh, once Design by Mario started, I remember in a matter of a year, uh, we ended up photographing in my first year of business we ended up photographing 50 weddings Mm -hmm. and for at least a whole decade we were shooting anywhere between 150 to 200 weddings a year Mm -hmm. um the bonus of what i learned from from the previous studio was the fact that i was charging a lot more keeping the keeping the the wedding uh how can i say i guess uh, charging more money and shooting less weddings Mm -hmm. um so coming from that background of shooting 400 i thought that's way too much um, even these days, you know, when I mentioned the word 150 or 200, that's probably a lot for people as well. Yeah. But I, the way I was brought up and, and having those skills, I guess I was able to shoot 150 to 200 and maybe charge double than what the market was charging at the time. Right. And still being able to get away with it. Okay. So, so, um, uh, so in, a, in a typical year, how many would you personally shoot nowadays? Um, nowadays, um, I basically shoot, I don't think I'd be shooting more than 50 weddings a year myself. That's still um, a heavy load. Every, it basically is. every week. Yeah. Yeah. Basically every week. I, um, the studio is slowing down now. I guess in 2000 and, what are we in 2019, Joe, are we? Or not? No, yes, we are. Oh, yeah. That's how much. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, basically the studio, um, in the past five years, um, we've been able to manage a consistent flow of bookings. Mm-hmm. Um, However, it has been getting more and more difficult every year. So, you know, I do, I do feel that any photographer coming into the, <clears throat> excuse me, coming into the industry today needs to be very clever and, and, you know, listen to great podcasts and, and, uh, people like yourself on, online and, and, and really get that education. Yeah. Um, well, I can't I, I, you hear that from everybody, right? There's more and more competition. Uh, the barriers mm-hmm. to entry are getting lower and lower. Um, there's more mm-hmm. and more opportunities for, uh, for learning and conferences. So, so yeah, so to stay in business, um, especially with a larger studio, you have to really be on top of things. You have to Definitely. be aware Definitely. of the competition and, and, you know, be networking and marketing and mm-hmm. the whole, the whole, all your business skills come into play to be able to pull that Definitely. off. Yeah. And I think it's important, no doubt. Yeah. So, so mm-hmm. my question then, so, for, so since you've been shooting a long time and you still should have a heavy shooting schedule, uh, mm-hmm. in terms of keeping, uh, keeping the passion for photography alive, keeping that, uh, yes. internal fire burning for, for the love of photography, because your, your work is still, uh, very creative and, uh, you could easily see, you know, slacking off and doing it for the easy stuff after a while, but you can still see you're pushing the envelope on a lot of your shots. So, so what do you do to keep that alive? 
Um, you know, I guess for me, this is my most frequently asked question, um, is how do I keep the passion? And it's very simple. I think after, after photographing for so many years, um, you know, to, to photograph and continually keeping, keeping it new and keeping it fresh is really what keeps me alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing that I didn't realize is us wedding photographers, and I don't, I don't think a lot of other photographers could maybe understand this, but we are adrenaline junkies. When you consider mm-hmm. the fact that, you know, we are working 110%, 20, you know, we're, we're talking about eight hours solid, no break, no, no nothing. And, and the thrill of, of getting an image yeah. that, um, that looks amazing is almost, you know, um, addictive. Yeah. And, and you're still you know, chasing that, that, those great yeah, shots. You're, you're still, still chasing it. Yeah. When, when you get something yeah. amazing and you look at the back of your camera, you go, I got it. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, maybe a lot of wedding photographers don't realize out there we are quite a unique breed. There isn't many um, industries or, or jobs like our job. And I think for me, that's sort of what's kept the passion is really chasing that photograph. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's step one. Step two is was also, I guess, for me, how to manage my lifestyle and, and be rewarded accordingly. Um, because let's face it, we can't pay the bills by um, by just having a fantastic shot. Um, so I think that coupled up together with chasing the image um, and, and that feeling, I think for me, every time I go out on a wedding, knowing that there's an opportunity here to photograph um, an award-winning image mm-hmm. really does push, does really push you. Um, but the most important thing, and I say this to a lot of younger photographers out there, um, and what I do every week is the fact that I always encourage myself um, to come up with four different photographs, mm-hmm. whether it's lighting, posing, style, to photograph on each wedding that I haven't photographed mm-hmm. before. Personal challenges. Now, Mm-hmm. Yes, correct. Now, if you do that, Joe, what you find is that if you reflect back on your work a year earlier, you have a completely different style or you've got a completely different range of images to work from. Mm-hmm. So if you can imagine doing that for even three, four years, you're building up a bank of so many different ideas and concepts mm-hmm. that are fresh. That's brilliant, so, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I really encourage photographers out there to go out there and photograph four different things that they haven't done in the past. Now, I don't mean that by subject of four different brides, but I mean that by using uh, one could be just different lighting technician, uh, lighting techniques, another one could be a different pose, another one could be a different lens, and so on and so on, um, where you're just consistently challenging yourself. And that's really what's kept the passion for me. Mm. There's look. There's no doubt. There's going to be days, Joe, and, and you've experienced it too, that things just don't go your way. Yeah. And what you do is you get into that wedding and you smash out the best possible wedding you can, considering the um, uh, the weather, considering the couple, considering the circumstances. So you do what you've got to do, but you need to keep it fresh every wedding. Yeah, and that takes a certain amount of discipline, right? So um, yeah, I've spoken about this before. Um, to be able to, to do that, to have that discipline, to push yourself and challenge yourself, uh, mm-hmm. you have to get out of your comfort zone and you have to push yourself to do that. It's so easy, like you said, it's so easy to, especially after a while near the end of the season, you're getting tired, you just want to crank mm-hmm. it out. Uh, yeah. But uh, it takes a certain amount of personal fortitude and discipline to say, okay, I'm going to continue to push my, my art, I'm going to continue to push my craft, and I want to create something new and fresh for myself and for my client. That's... Uh, that, that's where it really what separates the pros, I think. Yeah. And, and you know what, Joe? I think brides and grooms and, and your customers really see that. I think um, so too. Um, and I think that's where, you know, um, you know, the good old simple theory of what goes around comes around. If mm-hmm. you have a bride that see, that bride and groom that see that you're so passionate about your work, um, automatically you're nearly there because these guys must think to themselves, well, shit, this guy's really good. Mm-hmm. Um, or, Definitely want you know. Definitely want to see these photographs. So without doing that sales and marketing thing, um, you know, I think it's great that people can see that coming out in the person. Mm-hmm. No doubt. Do you think that kind yeah. of contributes to you um, sort of creating your own niche in the market to, to separate yourself out from your competition? It definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I think the key secret. I believe is to create yourself your own niche market, especially in the marketplace that we have today. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
you know, the, the, I guess with the internet, obviously, as we said, you know, um, everyone can uh, showcase their work, which is amazing. Um, but a lot of people are doing the same style. And, you know, I've seen a lot of styles come and go. So what you'll tend to find is that every, every five to seven years, the style will change. Mm-hmm. I guess what I've done in the past is I have never, ever looked at any style that was out there in the market and created my own style. Um, in the sense of, you know, um, my beliefs, my um, uh, techniques, all the above, all things that I thought looked really good. Um, and it's, oh, it's lucky enough that it's paid off. Um, so I've never sort of really paid too much attention to how or what people were doing out there in the sense of style, not photography, but just style of photography, mm-hmm. and giving the bride and groom um, something different. And uh, I guess... You know, as a bride and groom, and we all know that bride and grooms um, only get married once, and they're they're new newbies to 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 the whole scenario of right. picking a photographer. If you can stand out amongst the other three photographers that they've been to, and your work is 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 different in whichever way possible, it it could be just a totally um, totally different way you print. Um, you find that you start to get your own little niche market that way. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, and you've got to always remember, and this is maybe where a lot of photographers um, maybe fail to under, understand this, but brides and grooms do this once. Um, some do it twice. The third time, it's free of charge at my studio. So Really? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I think, you know, brides and grooms, we all need to know and remember that they're not photographers themselves. Right. And if they see something uniquely different to to the other three photographers that they've been to, they will really, really respond to that. Yeah. And that's that's sort of been my motto the whole time. Yeah, I think and that's true. Worked. I think that's true for, for many clients. I think there are also, are also some clients that have a hard time uh, differentiating between photographers if they just look at the images because there's lots of really great photographers. So sometimes mm-hmm. I think the difference is not just the photography and to, to make them confident that they'll get great pictures, but it's that personal interaction. It's the way that they feel when they, when they come to meet you. It's it's how they consult with you. It's it's the feeling of yes, I can work with this guy, you know, or, or this girl, or I can I feel like um, we're on the same page, you know. So mm-hmm. so talk a little bit about like how you do your client interactions. Um, I'm assuming you have well, like, like a studio space to to meet your clients. Yes, in. yes. Um, uh, I guess we've been in the heart of uh, what we call a suburb of Fitzroy here in Melbourne, mm-hmm. which is about a, two kilometres away from the city centre. Um, it's a very bohemian um, sort of suburb, so it's a great arty sort of area. So it's perfect to have a photographic studio it's there. Good, yeah. Um, it is, it is. So um, I guess uh, from my perspective, when clients walk in and, and the interaction, I think number one and what a lot of photographers need to maybe um, pay a bit more attention to is information. Information is king at the moment. And to have what I call a new inquiry. Would you call it a new inquiry on your intro sure. for someone yeah, who comes absolutely. in the first time? Yeah. So, um, you know, immediately rather than just booking them in for a time with their first two names and a wedding date, um, it's important to chat with them on the phone even before you come in. For mm-hmm. instance, where the reception venue is, where their ceremony is being held, um, you know, which dress designer they're going to. This is all important information that you can collate before they even come. And I call this my ammunition, where you can already have images ready from that mm-hmm. reception, mm-hmm. from Excellent. the yeah. ceremony or the church. Um, and and brides and grooms yeah. react to that because of the fact that they're not artists themselves. But if you can show them images that that may be them in that image, and it's quite unique by showing them and homing in on the fact that this is your venue, this is your ceremony, hang on, this is your dress designer, um, you, you know, and then you, what starts to happen is you're automatically uh, creating this bond between you and the couple without them actually realising it. So um, that's always a great way to start. Yeah. And, well, it gives them and, a sense of confidence too because, you know, We've all been asked a million times by our prospective clients, you know, I'm getting, sh- uh, we're getting married at this particular venue. Have you ever shot there before? Yes, well, you know, exactly. I've shot a thousand yeah. weddings. I can shoot at exactly. any venue, but yes, I've shot there before. And here's some great yeah. pictures and imagine yourself there as well. Yeah. So I guess that's always a great way to start with, with a couple when they're coming in for the first time. Yeah. Uh, another great thing is to, we, we need to be very attentive to, um, to their thoughts, um, you know, and, and be quite 
um, I guess probably the best way to describe it is be quite sensitive to, to their needs um, and really show that, not only by verbally saying that, by also body language. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I always, and I guess another good important thing too is when they're coming into your studio, always offer them a coffee because a lot of the times it could be after hours, mm-hmm. you know, especially the groom starting to shut off, uh, little little things like that. Mm-hmm. What, I've, what I've also found is that um, brides also remember you by sense of smell. Um, mm-hmm. So I actually have a candle and it's called wedding cake. Um, mm-hmm. And brides remember me from that beautiful smelling studio that I had. Interesting. That's a, I've it's, never heard about something like that before. So yeah. That's probably true. Uh, it's part of the whole. You, it's part of the whole yeah. sensory experience, right? Um, for instance, um, you know, if you've ever been to Las Vegas, have you noticed how, you know, mm-hmm. you, know you go to each hotel and they have their own sense of smell. Mm-hmm. They might use the whole the whole same. Yeah, they smell yeah. like cigarette smoke to me, but <laughs> <laughs> well, in the foyer that is. <laughs> right. yeah. um, so little things like that, I find also help. Um, I guess um, you know another another more important I guess important factor is um, showing them albums mm-hmm. that are, are maybe quite unique that a lot of other photographers aren't using in the same area. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's also a great thing as well. Um, I guess the list goes on, but these are the little points I believe um, the little what I call the two percenters um, that once you start adding ten two percenters. Um, it adds to twenty percent, mm-hmm. and and they're the important things that um, when when brides and grooms come into the first time for your studio, um, you know that you've got to keep you know creating those little subliminal messages. Yeah. They actually, there there is one more that I learned from my uh, GP, my uh, doctor. Mm-hmm. And have you noticed, um, Joe, that when you go to a doctor and and uh, they're sitting uh, behind their desk, um, what do they have behind them? They have their certificate. Mm-hmm. They have their uh, their diploma or their credentials, their, right? Yeah. Their credentials, do that. Mm-hmm. That, um, yeah, and that's really, really important to have your awards. If you hopefully have some awards, mm-hmm. um, or even things like you know front covers of a magazine or anything that you know is relative to that, to really show your stature and and just show that hang on, you know, this guy just isn't an, uh, a photographer and normal photographer. He's you know he's award winning or all the above, and to have those right behind you, yeah find helps a lot as well. Yeah. Now, I guess for me, um, <clears throat> I didn't do that for about the first 10 years of, of my studio. And I remember having a client come in and uh, calling her up later on and, and obviously she didn't book me. And mm. I asked, oh, can, do you mind me asking what's the reason behind why you didn't book? Oh, I booked someone else because he had awards displayed. Oh, Wow. Sometimes so, it's, it's just little things. You just, just never know what it's going to be. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's just yeah. those little things. So what you're so what you're doing then, and your advice would be take take uh, pay attention to all of those little details because they all add up, and to exactly. add up to the full experience. And it could just Correct. be one of those little two percent items that puts you over the top in terms of the booking. Correct. Yeah, Correct. and I guess the more and more uh, attention to detail, and the more of those little details that you that you do attend to. That helps to justify, you know, a higher price, right? Because you, the the, the client sees it's a full package. This guy has been around a exactly. long time. Uh, mm-hmm. I have zero concerns that, that it's going to go wrong, um, mm-hmm. right? Well, look, I think you know, creating your own niche market too, Joe. If you, if you do have a slightly distinctive style difference to everybody else, that you're automatically creating your own niche market because the bride and groom know that. Hang on a sec. If I go somewhere else, I'm not going to get this style. I'm not going to mm-hmm. have this type of style of photography. So I think that has a lot to do with it too, um, because you're offering that slightly different style. Now, I guess you know we're talking in a very broad way so i want you know all the viewers out there to know that cropping an image slightly different or turning an image into black and white just isn't enough these days it doesn't cut it you've really you know you've really got to show to a layman person how your style is quite different so it needs to really stand out mm-hmm. and, um, that's probably a good way to to start making br- brides and grooms and you know the the common person who doesn't know much about photography um, to really start to see hang on this guy's different and 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 that's where you can create your niche market and that's where you can start to maybe charge a little bit more mm-hmm. but small steps of course yeah. I, you know I don't, I don't want photographers to go out there and then overnight 
you know, um, charge double because um, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. You have to have all the things surrounding that price to support that price and justify that price before you can do yes. it. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, and and it's, a, it's a journey. It's a journey for all photographers out there to, to sort of do that. Um, but in saying that, you know, I think if they can learn these skills as quick as possible and, and, and go for it, I think, you know, um, and be smart about it, I think people can get there quicker than others. So, you know, I really want to encourage all photographers out there to get up there and, and start charging more because I have in the past five to eight years seen a big decline in, in, in photographers charging accordingly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because, you know, studios like yours that are higher end, that, that charge a higher price, uh, are surviving and are, yeah. per, are persisting. Uh, just, you'll, you'll just, I know, but but you'll see a lot of of uh, newer photographers or younger photographers starting out, and they charge. They can't even. It's just like um, beer money, right? It's just money to, mm. to pay for gas, and yeah. they, they they can't last. It, it, it doesn't last. So they, they're going. There'll always be this constant wave of new people coming in and, and dropping out because they can't sustain it. Um, mm. Well, this is why, Joe, I really encourage um, photographers out there not to go immediately out in the industry and charge nothing, but to go with other photographers who have exactly. been in Good the advice. industry for a while mm -hmm. um, and, and learn that way because they're going to learn quicker rather than going out and doing it themselves. And then what they're doing is is, is maybe taking a chunk, what we call a chunk, out of the market. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why, you know, with anyone starting out, they'll always encourage them first to to um, not roll the dice and play a bit of Russian roulette because, you know, at the end of the day, if you don't do a good job, then you could end up being sued. Although you may charge a hundred dollars or two hundred, you may have to pay back for the whole wedding. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is where I do encourage people starting out to go out to photographers rather than automatically sort of say to themselves, "I'm a photographer now." You know, I'm gonna mm -hmm. gonna go there and charge accordingly so like i said um you know and i want to keep sort of persisting by saying this is that information is king these days and, and it is important that um we follow those rules okay so let's take a, a case scenario let's say i'm a i'm a I've, i'm a photographer i've never really mm -hmm. shot a wedding before uh mm -hmm. but i'm really interested in wedding photography and i see you you and your studio and i yes. call you up or i send you an email say you know i really want to be a wedding photographer Will you, uh, can I c come and learn from your studio? Can I do an internship? You know, how do you vet that person? How do you bring them into your studio and train them? And, and what's that process yeah. like? Um, I think these days what a lot of people need to remember, and, and for, if I put myself in that position of photographers, is we're influxed every day with emails, um, with people demanding our time, people demanding our um our advice so the first thing i would always recommend is for the persons to actually go and meet the photographer knock on their door mm. and show how passionate they are and emails and, are too and, easy yes yeah emails are too easy definitely and i actually took on um, a person on an internship about 15 years ago who's now a great photographer um who came into my studio um out of the blue Lucky was at a good time. There wasn't any clients or anything along those lines. So, you know, especially if if a young photographer out there is going to go see a photographer, preferably not on a weekend because they're shooting, and then preferably not late, late at night because they're consulting. Right. So, you know, around midday time is always a good time, number one. Um, but I actually um, hired a person because he'd come in, and there was a little bit of a piece of paper on the ground, and as he was leaving – um, I think it was a piece of paper or a leaf because it was autumn time when they were walking out. He picked it up and walked out of the studio. And I thought, there's a guy who's paid attention to detail. And mm -hmm. I oh, took him that, on. It's that 2%. And, it's that little thing, right, that you notice. Exactly. Yeah? Yeah. It's those little 2 percenters. And mm -hmm. I think going out there and speaking to the photographer and, and showing how keen you are, an email can never do that. You know, and, and I get weekly, um, you know, weekly uh, people emailing me and look that's great and i think it's a great avenue to introduce yourself mm -hmm. but then why not follow up that email with a face-to-face -face, hey this is me i'd love a, a job here i'd love to work with you i'm really keen i'm really passionate and um you know uh start off that way mm -hmm. i think that's the best way to go about it so if you've never if you don't have much photography experience or you've never shot a wedding before you'd probably just start them off by uh being an assistant by carrying bags yes. and holding lights yes. and Yes, definitely. Right. Holding lights, the, the works, and we all have to start somewhere. I was mm -hmm. like that. 
and um, I guess the days were different when I was was you know um, starting out as well. So things were different. So I can't really um, say how it works out there at the moment. But um, you know, I, I think starting from the bottom and and why you know holding the camera equipment and holding the flash and and holding the lighting and, and all the above. You know, once they're there, they shouldn't have the attitude of oh, I, here I am, just a, a donkey carrying everything. Look at what the photographer is doing. Why has he decided to use the flash now? Why has he decided to use the tungsten light? Why has he decided to use this lens? And, you know, there are the important factors that you can be an assistant by carrying equipment for, I think, even eight months, six months. Mm -hmm. And you're learning the craft. You are seriously out there. And, and if you're quite inquisitive and switched on, um, you're going to learn a lot from even just carrying the equipment. Sure. Yeah, ask, no ask questions, but not maybe exactly. not during the busy part of the wedding. Maybe ask yeah, the questions after start. the wedding. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, well, that's great. I uh, want to look at some photos of yours so we can just sort of oh. get a get a, a view of your style here. I'm going to switch not over to. So you sent me uh, uh, you sent me some some images. We're going to look at them. Uh, you'll see them on the Facebook uh, feed. Otherwise. I can just sort of describe them to you. So, yep. uh, so we use some attempt photos. So this is, uh, go back to here. There we go. Okay. So, so we have a man looking, talking to Jesus here. What's good? What's going on here? <laughs> uh, what, an, what an image. Not, knock um, on, knocking the, what is it? Knocking the door will be answered, right? Or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, Look, this image is probably, believe it or not, one of my favourites of the year. Um, I photographed this last year. I think it would have been in February. Um, it was quite amazing that I'd turned up to the bride's home and I'd gone into to the corridor. I looked back and that's actually um, mum and dad's house. And dad had decided that from many years ago when he first moved into the house, he'd have a, a, uh, a portrait of Jesus on the back of the door. So he's quite religious. And I looked at the door and I thought, oh, my goodness, this never happens in 30 years of, of <laughs> photography. There, there's uh, an image there somewhere. I've got to I gotta yeah, use this. Yeah. i got to use it. <laughs> there's, an image, there's an image here in yeah. this. And, and as you can see, um, uh, one of my favorites because of the fact that I still remember it quite vividly. I, the dad was greeting all his friends that were walking in. Ah, okay. um, and... <sighs> I remember the uh, bridesmaid screaming down the corridor saying to me, oh, no, the bride's ready now. The dress is on. And I'm like, hang on, wait five <laughs> minutes, wait three minutes. I got something I just, here. Hold on. Yeah, yeah, I've got something here. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it was fantastic. You can see on the right side there the rack of um, mm -hmm. of dresses. That gives you the just context, the, yeah. Yes, the veil of the bride. Mm -hmm. So I knew that when I, I saw the door, I thought if I didn't at least quickly run in there and, and grab um, the rack of, of bridesmaids' dresses, that it would, if I didn't put that there, that would have been a religious photograph, yeah, which right. is so great as well. Yeah. But to add the context of, of um, a wedding, what I did do is I ran into the room, grabbed the bridesmaids' dresses, um, grabbed at least the bride's veil because remember she was ready to put, she was ready to put on her dress so I couldn't grab the dress at the time so these are little things that you know sort of people don't see and adding the dresses there is really what made the shot yep. the last thing I had to do was wait for dad to open that door and start greeting his mm -hmm. his family and friends so you, and didn't, then you didn't give him direction there you didn't say go over no. and open the door right so it is what it is there exactly so that's the beauty of that image is the fact that I was sitting there for literally three to five minutes. My assistants are thinking, what's going on here? What's he doing? <laughs> He's waiting. <laughs> He's coming. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, well, I think you got lucky, too, with the way the light comes, because the door yes. comes open and the light from Jesus is coming at him, right? It's like he's opening yeah, the door yeah. into heaven or something. Yeah. Because the that, light could have been flatter and it wouldn't have worked as well. Mm, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And, and you can see the way he opens the door as well. It's just beautiful. It's just um yeah, for me, something really special. Yeah, really special. And that's and that's the thing too for that uh, a lot of clients don't realize is is uh, a photographer sees an opportunity, and they have to take steps to make that re that photo a reality. It's not yes. just always just capturing immediately what's there in front of them. It's sometimes it's waiting, waiting, and waiting, and knowing that mm -hmm. something's going to happen. And it, sometimes it really pays off. 
Look, it is a sixth sense, and I think, um, I guess, drawing back on the skills that we've learnt for years, I think it really does help. Um, and sometimes, honestly, it's luck. It's a bit of luck as well. Yeah. Like, who would have known that I'd turn up to a house and here's a full-size portrait of Jesus on the back of a mm-hmm. door? You know, that's a sign from Jesus to yeah. say, hey, take this bloody photograph. So, you know, it worked well. It worked well. Well, we always like to say, too, it's not, it's not just pure luck because luck sort of favours the prepared, right? So. Um, yeah, very true. Very true. So this is a nice uh, overhead shot. A very stu- and, and again, I want to get to the, this aspect of your photography. Obviously, you're, mm-hmm. you're a fan, or you're you're drawn towards very graphically um, strong, bold images of graphic elements. Yes. So this is a nice, obviously, incredibly bold red stripe, the black umbrella. So how do? Oh, okay. So, know, so yeah. Yes. So is that the one with the red carpet and <laughs> the all the red yeah. carpet and all the black umbrellas over top? Yes. 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 Um, I guess for me, this is my answer to all those brides that say, oh, Mara, what happens when it rains? Mm. Mm-hmm. And um, in Melbourne, I guess with people obviously who don't live in Melbourne understand that um, anywhere between the period of, let's say, May, June, July and August, it's a very grey city um, where it's always very overcast and it doesn't tend to rain heavily. It just, in Melbourne, it tends to drizzle a lot um, come times like July and August in the winter periods. Um, but also as Australians, we love getting married in the winter because what happens is all my, our brides and grooms go over to Europe, which is their mm. summer, or America to have a great summer holiday or have a great summer honeymoon. So, you know, we do have a lot of enthusiast brides and grooms who are prepared to get married in the winter. And um, this is really an image dedicated to all my brides that come in and say, oh, Mara, what happens when it rains? So I'm actually on a bridge there, believe it or not, um, a bridge that I sourced out when I was going for my bike rides because mm-hmm. that's another thing that I tend to do is I actually once a month um, cycle around the city of Melbourne and find new locations that I can photograph. And that also inspires me as well. That's something I forgot to mention earlier was the fact that, nice you know, yeah, so, you know, 12 times a year I'm finding new locations. But this location is me hanging over a bridge. I knew it was going to rain, um, so you can see there there's a little bit of rain. I came equipped. I actually went to the um, uh, to the equivalent of a, uh, 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 I guess we call it a Kmart here, or um, I don't know what you call it there in America. Yeah, Kmart, and, Walmart, yeah. Walmart, that's mm-hmm. the word, Walmart. Um, and, and bought myself 15 umbrellas. Cost me $130 in umbrellas. Um, and, That's dedication. And, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and they all match and, too that way. Ex- exactly. Mm-hmm. So um, from there, rolling out the red carpet, which I use um, uh, quite often with some of some of my work, um, gives it that graphic feel so you can see how the red really does mm-hmm. kick in. Um, and you're right, it is a graphic image. And all I've asked is the bride and groom to walk out of the car and walk down the red carpet with the bridal party holding the umbrellas. Ah, okay, bridal party. So, yes, so bridal party Sorry. holding the umbrellas. So here I am, I've, you know, when I envisage this shot, I've created the graphicness of the umbrellas and the red carpet, mm-hmm. which is quite striking. But then what I've done is I've let the bride and groom do what they would normally do, which is ask them to walk across the red carpet. And there's your shot. So here it is, graphic in in quite a quite a big sense, but also um, posed in a in a very sort of natural aspect of them sure. doing something that would naturally do. But at the so, same time, it was clearly you know in your mind you had pre visualized more or totally, less more or less totally. what you wanted it to look like. Yeah. Yeah. Now um, you need to like what I find is I need to be very crystal clear in my head um, the image before I actually execute it mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Um, it is difficult to do, but it, it, you need to have some preconceived idea of what you're wanting to do yeah. um, before you go out on the wedding day. That's really, really important. And and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, what I have heard is the way that uh, a lot of Australian weddings go and wedding photographers work is you will have time during the day of the wedding to go and do correct. some of these shots. You'll have a, a set number of hours where we're going to do a <laughs> bunch of different photos and um that's not always true in many parts of of the world. It's, it seems to be no be uh, maybe in some places, but definitely it's common in Australia. And yeah. and, and the bride and groom ex- expect it, right? Yeah. Well, I guess you know, um, uh, being here in Melbourne, Australia, we, you know, 
we, let's say, would have a ceremony at 2 o'clock mm -hmm. and reception at 6. So after the ceremony is finished, you have three hours worth of photography. Um, a lot of photographers around the world would love that, um, you know, with the fact that you've got heaps of heaps of time. But it's not as easy as what photographers think because the expectations mm. from the bride and groom, knowing that you've got three hours, also, believe it or not, want to go to three to four different locations around the city. Mm. So you really work fast. Correct. Yeah. So people seem to, you know, I, I really want, you know, this myth overseas to because i get asked this question quite often especially when i travel and and go to to meetings with other photographers i think oh this is amazing this is quite easy but it's actually quite difficult because we're going to three to four different spots mm -hmm. um where it's equivalent to to you photographing a wedding ceremony and then half an hour worth of photography and then straight into the reception the only thing is we're doing it four times fourfold yeah um and, and, and not, i've been part of some commercial photography um um situations and you know for a commercial photographer like say they're doing this for an advertising shot this would take like an entire day to set up and light and execute mm -hmm. and you're, you're, you're you have maybe 45 minutes to do it right right yeah. now what you, what you also need to remember um joe is the fact that when you're looking at these images i have at least two assistants with me sure um i don't think i'd be able to to capture what i capture and how i capture it um, without any assistance with me. Um, that's another really important factor as well. Yeah. So, a nice, but, a uh, nice tip. And, and, and again, not everybody has that luxury, but again, it's a different sort of expectation, different sort of style too. Correct, correct, correct. Okay, let's move on to the yellow and red photo. <laughs> this, My is, this is yeah. this is a big one because this is looks like a, it looks like a work of modern art is what it looks like. So <laughs> It does look yeah. like that, doesn't it? Only joking. Um, so, 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 so tell me about the visualization for this one, because this was not uh, this is like the like the <laughs> former one with the carpet and the umbrellas. Okay, you can visualize that. It's a wedding photo. Yeah. This is just yeah. like a just like like modern art of some kind. What's going on here? Uh, well, I went through a period in my life um, for about two months where I was just infatuated with cubism, um, uh, okay. uh, with you know, um, just googled everything. So. That's another good little thing that I do as well is um, pick a genre of art um, in the quiet periods of, of, of when I'm working and at least go through three or four different, uh, how can I describe it, different genres of, of painting or any of the above and, and draw ideas from that. Um, so I'll have what we would call a, a vintage week or a, uh, a Western week where all I do is just Google um, images or or things from that era, um, which allows me or inspires me to sort of sometimes create images that are sort of in that era. So I guess this image didn't totally come about that way because what you're actually looking at is um, the yellow the yellow triangles that you're looking at is actually a sculpture in Melbourne mm -hmm. um, that um, I've grown up with from the age of you know five or six or seven that I'd walk past all the time um, with, but. I always thought to myself, well, um, I always get those brides and grooms that say to me, oh, Maro, um, I, ha I hate having my photograph taken. So I knew I'd come across another bride sooner or later that would ask me that. And I just basically turned around to them and said, how about I hide you in a photograph? Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, you're on. You're on. Um, you know, and obviously using using the, <laughs> ye the yellow uh, sculpture mm -hmm. to get with a uh, board that I've then spray painted red. Mm -hmm. Now, what a lot of brides and oh, people don't know out there is, see that shaft of light coming through the side then? Yeah. Um, that's actually light, sunlight coming through. So you've got to remember I knew that I could only have this photograph taken on a certain period of time and a certain part of the year. Mm -hmm. So this photograph has sort of been in the making for a good six to eight months, having the right bride, um, right time of year, you know, you can imagine if it was um, overcast, then right. pretty, no picture. Pretty, right. No picture. So uh, it took me three or four times to get it right, and um, yeah, I absolutely love it. It's one of my actual ultimate favorites. And well, it certainly stops you in your tracks. You say that is not a regular wedding photo. <laughs> it isn't. And look, I, I really must admit, um, it's one of those images that you know I, I love as an artist, as a photographer. But it either has that complete appeal to a bride or it totally doesn't. So I tend right. to find 
but, um, it's but either way, they're not going to forget it. It's going to define it, define you to some degree. Yeah. Yes. Very true. Very true. Okay, that's really amazing. Okay, this is the black and white with the bride sitting in the swoop. Another looks like a very swoopy sculpture. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, I guess for me, uh, is that the black and white one, Joe? Is yeah, that... black and white. With yeah. Um, uh, I guess probably the best way for me to describe this is just modern art again, very mm -hmm. similar to the last image by relying on sculpture to 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 really uh, create the mood. Um, what that is, believe it or not, is it's an actual hospital in Melbourne. Um, I found this image by by accident, or found the location by accident. On one, one, one of your bike rides. Uh, no, this one was um, just walking out of a hospital and across oh. the road I have a look and there's another hospital and, and bang, there it is. Um, uh, very dragon-like. I always looked at that uh, sculpture as an, an eye of a dragon. Um, I knew that if I had a petite little bride I could, or a bride, I could get her inside of, of that mm -hmm. little uh, uh, curve. eye, mm -hmm. curve, eye, um, mm -hmm. and then at the That's same time, eye. yeah. So um, I guess for me... You know, then having a veil, a 15 metre veil that I have in my car all the time, um, to soften it up that way by letting the bride hold that veil and having one of my assistants hold the veil going out of the image and mm -hmm. creating flow and movement would sort of create a very similar um, sculpture sort of look, but only making it, you know, uh, human, I guess, in a way. So using the, the element of, of, of architecture and then using the human element of the veil. I think sort of brought these two images together. Yeah, I think it's a it's a good point, even for photographers uh, that don't get the luxury of that, uh, you know, three, three or four hour photo shoot, to e at least go early to the venue and sort of walk around, pre visualize, uh, make mm -hmm. sure make sure you understand where the light's going to be, where the sun's going to be, find some yeah. of those spots uh, where you can make some interesting photos, and instead of just because if you do it on the fly, then you're, you you have no uh, you mm. less of a chance of finding an interesting spot. So do do, do do a little bit of homework, do a little bit of pre visualization, do a little scouting. It, it does pay off. I totally agree, Joe. I yeah. think um, they really do need to do their homework and go there the day before or a week before because if if the photographer goes out there on that location and then and has a good look, then they have a lot more of an opportunity to pre visualize an idea than turning up on the day. So yeah. totally agree. With you. Yeah, totally. This is a precious uh, photo of the little girl in the doorway uh, oh, that's crazy i love this image yeah. this is just a full image absolutely it reminds me of the jesus door image with the light coming in that way too <laughs> yeah i don't know what it was last year yeah. but um um you know the doors have definitely been quite predominant there yeah. um but as you can see I, I really can't say it too much here it's quite an easy um uh, image to, to see it, it is what it is especially if you have a close look at the expression on the little the little girl um it's gold it really is gold yeah. um there I was just capturing a candid image of just the groom getting ready and, and all the above, and then all of a sudden she comes out of the corridor and is all excited, and there's your image. You know, it was beautiful, beautiful. And I chose, obviously, to, sh to, to have this in black and white because it, it made the image a lot stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, I darkened it a lot more as well, so I, I allowed the little girl's expression to be the main emphasis here through the doorway um, and sort of darkened the groom, the groom quite a bit because I knew that people had to be drawn into into the little girl's expression and that was, um, you know, number one priority there. Yeah, no, I, w I wanted to talk about this one a little bit more because the post-processing, as you, as you talk about, is, is exceptional in, in this photo. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the way that you, it's, it's, it's you, can, you know that it's there, but it's subtle enough that it's not mm -hmm. distracting because my, my focus is still on the, the two figures in the photo and, and their interaction and, and, and the light. The light's mm -hmm. fantastic. And, uh, you know, as you said before, you're a little bit of luck to have that girl there with that expression. But again, mm -hmm. you were looking, you saw it, you know, you were prepared, and you were, right. you're really lucky Look, enough to get it, yeah. I regard that one as a fluke as well, but yeah. um, I'll, I'll take it. I'll yeah. take it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, post production yeah. is a is a is a tricky thing too because it can be overdone. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people um, some people don't mind it being overdone. They really, really love the digital art aspect of it. But sometimes, if it goes too far, then you, you know, is it art or is it a wedding photo? There's a, it's, a, it's a lot of gray areas in there. Yeah. Well, look, I think um, it's important for anyone to 
when they're retouching is is to keep it real um is is to to have that boundary of knowing what the difference is between um reality and and you know fantasy as well i think but um uh, looking and reflecting back on the image that's on screen there I, I guess you know um using tones as in what i would call darkroom techniques for instance dodging and burning we're making things lighter and darker um i do believe is one of the main main keys of, of retouching without having things to you know start to look a little bit sort of unrealistic yeah right so and, and, and again, I, I noticed you again. It's, I don't know if it's just built into your brain somehow, but the strong geometric patterns and graphic layout of, of the image with the light and the angles and the yeah. the, the flooring. I mean, it's the oh, it's well, just, yeah. Well, I guess I didn't even pay attention to that, Joe. Yeah. To be really honest, so um, but you know, I guess the the perspective was corrected yeah. and. Uh, of um, you know, it is a wide angle lens. Yeah. If I can remember that's correctly, a, so. that's okay too. And that helps. Yeah. That helps. Yeah, sure. So here's an, here's a, another a very interesting composition of where you see the bride in the in the oval mirror reflection, with the legs of the bridal party around her. Oh, uh, yes, this yes, is like this, a, a leg a, a leg heavy shot. A leg, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, with a bottle of champagne. Guess, uh, <laughs> well, they'd already drank that whole bottle of champagne. <laughs> Um, I barely had started my photography, but um, I went through an era of using that mirror. As you can see, I love I love reflections and mirrors. This is probably one of the older images, um, but it's it started. This was a period where every wedding that I would go to, brides and bridesmaids were ready um, and waiting in their robes rather than you know um, in their bride and oh, in their bridal gear. Mm-hmm. So I thought this would be a great opportunity for me to concentrate on shoes. Um, the legs looking quite elegant and um, the mirror reflecting the reflection of the bride. So if you can imagine my perspective, I'm actually shooting almost right over the top of the head of the bride, mm-hmm. shooting down her legs and then the legs are, um, I guess, again, quite graphic because they're pointing in towards the bridesmaids' um, uh, uh, legs as well. So it, it's an image for me that came purely by accident the idea this isn't one of those remember how we were talking earlier about going to a location and having a preconceived idea um this never happened like that it just happened on the go um the only thing i'd ask was the bride to sit down let me see what this would look like um i had the mirror next to me i thought let's place the mirror there and and next thing you know this image had come up Mm -hmm. so um quite i guess for me it was quite an image that um was quite bold and striking in the sense of, of shape and form again um, so you know what, Joe? You've taught me something as well. I'm starting to realize my images do have a lot of shape and form. Shape and um, form, and, shape and, and, form. And, and composition. I mean, you have a very yeah. obviously a highly developed sense of composition over over many years of experience. And um, you know, you take a lesser experienced photographer, and they probably wouldn't have have. They, it would be a completely different composition, right? Mm-hmm. Well, look, I, I think um, I think. Uh, if there's any pointers that I can give to photographers out there, and, and I think this is always a really good pointer, is the fact that you know you've got some amazing photographers out there that are shooting quite a few weddings, but what they don't do after every wedding is reevaluate which image they want to enter in an award. Or I have what we call an awards folder where every wedding that I photograph, um, I'd maybe pluck out three or four images of my favourites that I can then reflect back on and look at Mm -hmm. later on in here and decide, you know, which ones I would pick to to enter in awards or to showcase or all the above. So when you're a younger photographer out there, you struggle to to sort of work out which images are going to work well for you. So you need to take the time out to, to... to look back and reflect on your images and, and, and use these images where, you know, in future you could use them for awards. And if you can, if you have the time to reflect back on your work, I think that's quite important as a photographer to develop. Yeah, I agree. And I would do the same thing too. I would have an awards folder where, and it's typically sometimes one or maybe two photos per wedding would go into that awards folder. Um, yeah, exactly. one, ones that really, really popped out and I might say, Oh, that's, that's special. That's going to go in there. And yeah. sometimes it would take a little, like you said, a little post processing, maybe a little cropping. Um, but you, you, if you see the potential in the photo, you know, don't don't let it get lost. You know, mm. save it. And I, I think sometimes um, photographers do make them get lost, and they're great images. And then, you know, life gets you. You know, yeah. bills come, um, weddings are photographed, the next wedding comes you in. Busy. Life 
passes you so quick that you've got this amazing image that you've never entered anywhere or you've never showcased, and that's yeah. such a shame. It's such a shame. I think, again, I think it's one of those items of, uh, of discipline and, and your process. So if you build discipline items like that into your process, it'll, it'll just flow, and you'll be able to say, okay. But you have to think about it ahead of time. You have to plan for it, and you have to implement it, right? So. Definitely. Okay, so, okay. Here, so here's here's the red car with the bride shoveling the cake into the groom's mouth or something. Oh, uh, goodness. This is, uh, <laughs> this, this is guess, hilarious. It is. It's a hilarious image. This is an image um, where this couple, uh, this bride and groom, walked into my studio and, and said, and I'd asked them just prior to the wedding day, what do you guys like doing um, on a Sunday uh Without me being around or on a, on a Saturday, what do you guys like doing? And this couple were bigger than life. They had big characters, the two of them. And I'd asked the groom, what would you do on a Sunday afternoon? He said, I love eating cake. <laughs> that was, that's all he said. That's all he said. <laughs> what, what was actually quite unique is the bride, um, her father owns the biggest delicatessen or the biggest um, importer of Italian foods. Oh. So, um, obviously, here's the groom who loves cake. I had the bride's uh, bride who has grown up in, although she's grown up in Australia, has grown up in an Italian, uh, such an Italian environment because of this huge store that her father owns where they import everything from Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, that's hence the idea of using the Italian car, um, the cake, the groom loving the cake. Mm -hmm. Now, what you're looking at there is also the bride is feeding him with those big Italian spoons. You know how you go to an Italian restaurant? Oh, that's restaurant what it is, yeah, yeah. And they, they're hanging um, on the wall, right? Yeah, they're hanging yeah. on the wall. Yeah. So um, here I was, I, I used that because I had that available to me. And um, and here's the shot. They absolutely adored this mm. photograph. That was a huge image of that on the wall at um, mm. in home. And, that, and that's going to have uh, a lot of meaning for them too because you took the time to – find out about them and their interests and incorporated that into their shoot, right? Correct. And, and and this is where maybe a lot of people who don't know my style maybe can get a little bit construed about what I do and why has he done that. There's always a story behind it. So mm -hmm. there's a story. Yeah. And the story makes the photo, to be honest with you, because that's exactly. uh, maybe, maybe, you can tell it's still personal to them. And they're obviously, they're obviously, they're obviously having fun with it. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Okay, this looks like a, another high overhead shot of uh, the couple walking down the street with the uh, the turn signal painted on the ground. Yes, yes. Is this a drone? Um, is this a drone? Well, a lot of people ask me that question. Yeah. This is this isn't actually a drone. Or another bridge. Uh, oh. uh, no, I was hanging over their balcony, um, uh, photographing this, and then we've corrected the perspective on it, so it looks quite drone-like. Um, but this is the period and, you know, these are great periods where, you know, the bride is getting ready in the bedroom and you're just waiting for the bride. So I decided to actually have a look out the balcony and I looked down at the street because this is sort of one of the main, this would be sort of like, you know, 6th Ave, uh, which is Flint Street in Melbourne, which is equivalent to, to you know, your main streets in, in, um, in your own city. And you can see the tram tracks. I don't know, well, yep. Joe, you know, what, sure. well, you know what a tram is? Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 So, um, it, it is quite a graphic image, and I I just thought to myself, well, how about I just get the bride and groom walking and 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 use the arrow as your as your point of difference, where once the bride and groom walk across there, um, it it points out the bride and groom. So uh, this is probably one of my simplest images, simplest of images, yet quite graphic. Again, um, you know. Uh, urban art these days, I call it urban art, because really, you know, shooting in a city, you've got a lot of different options. It's what you make of it. And the things that sometimes we take for granted um, should be the things that we incorporate in our photographs. And you can see an arrow on the ground is something that we see everywhere around the world. Yeah. How can we use it to our advantage? <clears throat> and I feel I did that with this image. Very simple, yet quite effective. Yeah, but it, it takes a, I guess, a sort of developed um, artistic mind to look, because a lot of people would look down off that balcony, they would see that road, and they go, oh, there's a road. They, they, yeah. they wouldn't see the artistic possibilities or the compositional potential that it would have, right? Um, well, look, I guess for me, this image, I really did struggle um, because I was shooting on a 200 mil lens and it was quite dark and gray. Mm -hmm. um, what was quite funny, and I'll tell you a quick story about this, Joe, is like um, I had my assistant downstairs on the mobile phone. So you can imagine me holding my mobile phone on my shoulder and my ear 
as I'm hanging over a balcony photographing. And I kept asking my assistant downstairs to ask the bride and groom to hold hands. So I actually did this photograph three times or all, posed it three times. But each of the three times, um, my assistant forgot to mention to the bride and groom to hold it, their hands. Uh. I got quite frustrated. And I said, I said uh, you know, make sure you tell the bride and groom to F, hold hands. And my assistant turned around and said to me, Mara, you are on loudspeaker. <laughs> so so uh, after that, after we did that, we, they were held hands. They walked across and it worked really, really well. So yeah. great, sticker, but quite funny. Yeah. And the bride and groom giggle about that. But um, uh, another word of advice to any photographers out there, if you're speaking to your assistant, do not have it on loudspeaker. <laughs> good, a good uh, experienced voice uh, lesson. Yes. Uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, photos like this to me, um, uh, I really I really appreciate them because it, it takes a certain amount of vision to see that, and not everybody can do that. So, you know, hats off to you. Um, I'm, I, I'm a big art lover, any kind of both modern and uh, tr traditional art. I, I, I could live in an art gallery. So when I see people taking bold choices here on composition and, uh, you know, you see the lines, you see where the arrow is drawing your, your eye to go, you see the framing of the, of the green, um, you know, it just all comes together. So mm. congratulations. Well, thank you, Joe. Thank yeah. you very much. That's all. Great to hear that from you. Thanks. Jim. And then, uh, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, here we have looks like a big Italian dinner going on or something. So this is just like a this one's just full of life. This is this is not an artistic graphical type of an image, but you know, you can definitely see there's something going on here. Well, Joe, this is a crazy image, and this is I think something I photographed four or five years ago, but still is always my favorite. Um, we had finished the sequence of of the groom being photographed in the morning and uh, it had reached the point where uh, my assistant was packing up his camera gear and then I'd asked him, where's the camera case? And he said, in the kitchen. So I'd walked into the kitchen. I've gone to pick up my camera case. I've zipped my camera case up. I look up over the edge of the, um, of the table and I see all of this unfolding. Oh. So... Um, quite amazing. I absolutely loved it. And then again, bang, there's the photograph. It's a typical day that a mum force feeds their mm -hmm. tastes. Right, eat, eat. It's, it's a big day. So you can imagine when we go to the groom's home in the morning, um, it is the morning and he's getting married at 2 o'clock, so they need to eat. Yeah. So you can see the mum saying eat, 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 and then obviously, you know, we've manipulated it and mucked around with it as well. So we've created, you know, um, different images too. So this is only one of another uh, hilarious amount of images we photographed too. Although, you and know, was, it, we, it, from the client's perspective, I mean, I'm sure many clients love the artistic, graphical, composed, pre-visualized, you know, amazing images you, you can create. But every everyone appreciates the real-life moments that uh, because, you know, the, it was real. That was really happening, and, and the expression on the mom's face. Uh, yeah. You know, they'll they'll treasure this photo for a long time. Yeah, they do. And look, the thing is, I have you know, this is probably one of my more successful photographs where I have a lot of brides and grooms who will come in and say, "Look, I'd, I'd like something similar to that. Not yeah. necessarily spaghetti, but you know, uh, a bride would say, "I love, I love my ice cream. Um, you know, let's do something with that or anything like that." So yeah. it. It spawns ideas from the idea. I think that's probably what's most important. Yeah. And last photo we'll look at. Uh, here we have the bride silhouetted against a very uh, graphical design uh, wall. Yes, yes. Um, is that the one, Joe, that the, the bride has been manipulated? Almost looks like a... It's uh, like a doll, yeah. Yes, Or a puppet, yes. yeah. Yeah, like a puppet. Um, mm -hmm. That was never really the case on what I wanted to do. I didn't want it to look like a puppet, I, I guess... Um, for me, this image itself is, is an, a very graphic or, of course, graphic, but um, a very abstract image. Um, the wall that I, we chose to use was, was um, very shapely and very colourful. Mm -hmm. um, and the pose itself, that's me using an Alan Crom light behind the bride and creating sort of almost a silhouette. So I wanted my bride to be a shape on the wall, and I wanted to mimic that. And with the help of Jason, my digital retoucher, you can see with each limb how, you know, he's turned each portion of, of the bride's um, body into almost a shape in itself. Yeah, it's like an abstract art, yeah. 
image. Yes. So, and it is, it was an abstract art. As you can see, some of my latest images, I've been going a little bit more abstract. Um, I don't think I can go much more abstract than what I'm doing because I think I might lose, lose brides and grooms because it's not starting to look as realistic and, and all the above. But, um, you can see there, I've basically turned the bride into a piece of art in the sense of almost turning her into a part of the wall. Mm -hmm. Um, but the only way I could really capture that image, it was in my head for a little while. Um, the only way I could really do that, though, is by using a backlight like I did that's then been splashed on against the wall and um, has created a very shapely figure. The pose that I gave the bride or asked the bride to do um, was a very graphic pose. You can see just with the arms yeah. and the hands, um, using triangles, um, all the above. So, again, it's all those little two percenters that sort of, you know, everything from the pose um, that she's doing is quite graphic. Everything from the wall is quite graphic. The lighting that I'm using has enhanced the, the shapes and the graphicness of, of the bride. Put that all together, and what you've got there is, is just a, a very shapely image. Yeah, I can see, can you tell you it took a, a lot of time to make sure that the angles are exactly correct and match the, the wall. Yes, yeah, definitely tried my hardest to. Yeah, but, um, yeah. You can imagine, you know, I, uh, for that wedding, I only had time for one location. So mm -hmm. uh, it's not always, you know, you always have a lot of time. I always remember this this photograph being rushed so quickly. Mm -hmm. But I knew I couldn't let go of it. I had to capture it. I, I had the... I had the uh, I had the willpower to really get this image. This was done in literally two minutes. Wow, it's a very very bold vision, though, to say to to make her not almost not human, right? To be uh, mm. to take yes. that extra step. Yes, some, and, I'm and sure some clients would really go for that, and some would go like, "What?" <laughs> Exactly, yeah. and you need, you need to pick and choose your battles. Yeah. This client was an artist herself; she loved art. Oh, see, uh, and that sort of really does help as well. Yeah. So she loves her painting; she loves her abstract abstract images. So you can see that you know it's horses for courses, Joe. You can't. And, but there's you know, the, but there's the connection, right? She, you, could tell, you could tell that that's what she would go for, and she would appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, and that's the thing to photographers out there. If they're going to go and experiment with new ideas to each bride and groom, it has to be relative to them. I think mm -hmm. that's nothing point that I really do need to stress a lot to them. You know, I don't want any photographer out there to be creating these abstract images when, you know, the bride and groom aren't going to appreciate it or don't understand it. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, where we need to, like I mentioned before, we need to pick and choose our our uh, brides and grooms and when to do it with, yeah. with this. Because the thing is, you know, these images that we're looking at, Joe, it's not reality. It's not something that I would do in every single wedding I photograph. You know, these are selected course, images yeah. that, that um, you know, um, are, are picked out throughout the whole year, but it's not something I would do every, you know, I wouldn't do this abstract image on every wedding that I photograph. And photographers need to understand that. I don't want them to get caught in this whimsical style that I'm creating here that, that I've picked a handful of the 50 weddings that I've done where there's certain images. So, you know, the reality of a wedding is a wedding where you've got to capture the candid images and, and the beautiful moments where they see each other. This is this is all a bonus for the bride and groom. Yeah. And I, and I think yeah. what you've done uh, today, Mauro, is you've you've done a great, um, a great service to yourself in terms of, of explaining in your way, how you go the extra mile for, for both your art and your clients. Because I, I'm always telling people what separates um, the good photographers from the average photographers or, or is the willingness to go the extra mile and put in the extra effort. And for different photographers, that means different things, right? Correct. It depends on how they're going to do that. Um, but, yeah. your, but your devotion to your pre-visualization and your scouting and your your um, interaction with your clients to find out what's close to them. That's, that's a great example of, uh, uh, for other photographers to say, you know, I need to step up my game and go the extra mile and really do uh, an exemplary, exemplary service for my clients. So, oh, look, I think, um, you know, we all need to be proud of our work. And if we can do what we do and love what we do, Joe, and, and I think, you know, with everyone listening today or anyone who's a photographer out there, you know, it is we are a special breed of people. And sometimes we don't even know why we do it, but we just do it. But, um, you know, uh, it's important to be proud of what you do and, and, and try your hardest doing what you're doing. Excellent way to finish this up, Mauro. So thank you very much. That's, I really, really my, appreciated it. My pleasure. <laughs> really enjoyed job. every second of that. Yeah, exactly. I enjoyed talking to you as well, Joe. It's been fantastic and, and you know.
to be honest, I'm always working. So, you know, a lot of the times I don't get the time to, to, to talk photo- photography with people. So I've really thoroughly enjoyed today's time with you. So thanks a lot, Joe. Fantastic. And why don't you just tell people how they can find you or, or contact you? Um, or? Yeah, contact me on uh, or have a look through my website, which is uh, designbymaro.com. Um, have a look at my images. Uh, happy to chat. Uh, if people have got any difficulties or anything that they want to uh, need a little bit of help with, um, I'd be happy to help out as well. Okay, thank you, Mar. And we'll put all of your contact information on the uh, the YouTube video when we publish that, so they can get to you that Fantastic. way as well. Okay, excellent. Right, thank cool. you very much, right. and we'll talk, talk to you soon. Okay, bye bye.